Karen, welcome back again. So sorry for for craziness. No, that's that's fine. Um, um, that was very interesting to hear Steve's uh, talk. So, yeah. Um, so I guess I, I did put together a few slides in that uh, period of time. Um, I'm I'm gonna see I I see if I can uh, share my screen here. Yeah. Um, before we start, there's there's the question that came in at uh, like eight o'clock last night. Uh, that's just been sitting here waiting waiting for you. Um, okay. This is from this is from Becky Barnes, uh, who is on on Twitter as the Woodworm. Uh, she says you were a role model for young Becky. After seeing the fictional Dr. Ellie Sattler, you were the first real female paleo I found. Then later Mary Anning, but it's hard to ask her questions. Uh, has there been anything unexpected found in the copper lights you've worked with? Well, um, uh, that yes, there have been things that have been unexpected. I, I, I just want to tell the, the person who asked the question, thank you very much. It's nice to know that uh, you noticed my work. And even though I'm not tall and blonde like Ellie Sattler, um, I'm glad people saw female paleontologists. Um, so yes, we have been able to find um, things that really surprised us. For example, that some of the herbivorous dinosaurs were feeding on, um, some of them were feeding on crustaceans, which completely, it, it's just counterintuitive to most of our original um, preconceptions of, of herbivorous dinosaurs. That's just one example. Another example is that we, we find very well-preserved tissues and some organic geochemical com, uh, compounds in coprolites, um, things like muscle tissue. Um, so yes, we have found some interesting things. Awesome. Thank you for that. Sure. I, I remember that uh, that paper was just, what, three years ago? Uh, yes, it was. The crustacean paper. Yes. 2017. Yeah, yeah that, caused, uh, that caused a bit of chatter and not a few uh, carnivorous uh, hadrosaur memes. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. Um, so I would, before I get started here, I would just like to thank the conveners of this. Um, I, there aren't many uh, paleontologists of color. There are increasing numbers of us, um, but I, we certainly appreciate your support, um, especially from a field that is is still trying to diversify. So thank you so much for supporting um, underrepresented peoples in, in this world. So thank you so much for putting this on. Okay, so um, let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay, oops. Uh, one moment, please. <laughs> I just kind of threw these um, slides together from some old talks because I didn't realize that um, it would be good to have a uh, uh, slide presentation ready for this. I thought this was going to be a panel discussion. So, um, I it's 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 been it's been talks it's been uh just general discussion shooting the breeze okay you know whatever whatever works right. um and and also one more interjection just before you start we have hit twenty five hundred dollars raised for for all of our Ooh. black lives matter charities so you're all amazing and wonderful and and keep those donations coming 
Excellent. Okay, we'll try this again. I'm obviously going to have to get better at this uh, for teaching in the fall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, that still didn't work. So we'll just go back to the beginning manually. Okay. All right. Well, I just put uh, together a few um, uh, slides just to provide uh, a little bit of information for people who don't normally um, think about fossil feces, um, unlike some of us who think about it all the time. Um, I. I am a paleontologist, for those of you who are not aware. I, I am at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I am a, uh, a, an associate professor and a curator of paleontology at our museum. And I am most interested in studying Mesozoic ecosystems. And of, of course, a lot of people, when they first learn that I study feces, ancient feces, they think that's pretty bizarre. So I wanted to explain a little bit about why I do that. Um, I took this photo just last year. Um, this was down in Tasmania. This is what's called a marsupial meadow, where you have tons of scat from wombats and from kangaroos and wallabies. And that just kind of, I, I loved that image because it shows you the presence of scat in environments. Okay, this is maybe a little excessive because it was a constricted environment, it was an island, but scat, animal scat, is an important presence in um, our ecosystems. And it, it does show the presence and the activity and the abundance of ancient animals. Um, SCAT also can tell us about different kinds of feeding habits and trophic interactions. And sometimes if we're thinking about carnivorous animals, this can be very um, straightforward. Um, but if we're thinking about other animals or, or thinking about ontogenetic changes in, in animals as they grow older, we can, we can learn a lot about behavior. For example, here are two um, examples of bear scat. Uh, the one on the left is spring bear scat, where they were, that particular bear was concentrating on feeding on grass. And the one on the right is bear scat from the fall feeding on apples. So we have seasonal changes in behavior in animals, and we also have age changes or ontogenetic changes. And SCAT can also tell about those behavioral um, uh, changes and trophic interactions. I also think that SCAT is important because it, it's a physical receipt showing the transfer and circulation of nutrients in environment. Um, and this shows, of course, if we if we didn't recycle that scat, we'd be up to our eyeballs in it. And this just demonstrates that we, as, as animals, use nutrients and those are pushed back into the sediments. And our nutrients, when we die or from our scat, are pop up in other organisms all over. Um, SCAT also supports detritophores that recycle organic matter. And I took this picture out at uh, the Two Medicine Formation in Montana. This was actually some SCAT that was produced by Ray Rogers' dog. <laughs> and it was kind of fun because when we passed the SCAT, um, one time we saw a carrion beetle just really enjoying it. So. SCAT is important for that reason too. So feces actually offer different kinds of evidence for recycle, for the natural world, behavior of animals and for the flow of, of nutrients through ecosystems. So 
if we can learn so much from modern scat, we could actually learn tons from ancient scats, if only it could be fossilized, right? And that is the thing that blew my mind when I was uh, first began to work for Jack Horner back in the Museum of the Rockies, back at the Museum of the Rockies <laughs> a number of years ago, that people actually have found fossilized feces. And this is very, it was very surprising to me back then. And it's, it, it's still kind of mind boggling to think that this can happen. But if we think about it, I think we're surprised because there are so many reasons why it shouldn't be preserved. It's easy to degrade, um, not only from bacterial and fungal degradation, but um, it can be kicked around, it can be rained on, and there can be animals like dung beetles that feed on it. Um, also, if we wanna preserve it, this usually requires pretty specific conditions and those conditions are usually rapid burial. So that is, that is great if you're in aquatic environments, but if you have feces deposited on land, that's less apt to be rapidly buried. So there's all these reasons why we should not preserve feces very, very readily, especially because it's soft tissue that's just subject to degradation. But there are also some reasons why maybe we should preserve it. And my favorite um, example is if you think about it, an animal only dies once, right? Yeah. But it defecates many, many times, zillions of times when it's lifetime. So if you have a chance to be fossilized as a fossil, as a body fossil, you only have one chance. But if you are defecating, you have many chances to be immortalized. Another reason why there's feces can be preserved is that um, diets can include minerals that can contribute to um, mineralizing the feces. And this is particularly important for animals with carnivorous diets. It's most obvious if we think about um, animals that are eating on bone, which of course has lots of calcium phosphate in it, but even animals that are just simply feeding on soft tissue. There are lots of, of, of compounds such as, um, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm blanking now, NADPH, um, nucleic acids, various things that have phosphorus in them, even if you're not talking about bone. But perhaps the most important reason why we can preserve feces is that feces are basically bags of bacteria. And bacteria, as we are learning, are so important to um, facilitating fossilization. And the reason for that is that as bacteria grow, even though it seems counterintuitive, they are destroying things, they're feeding on things in their environment, but they're also changing the environment, the microenvironment around themselves and actually making it conducive for mineralization to occur. So this happens in soft tissue mineralization of say muscle tissue in the fossil record or, or feathers, but it also occurs in fossilization of bone. And it also occurs in the fossilization of feces. And this um, slide shows that many, many, there's aqua, Several, we'll say it that way, several people have demonstrated that inside, when they look microscopically at the ground mass of coprolites, they can actually see uh, small um, shapes that are the right size of bacteria, suggesting again that 
This is why we preserved um, some coprolites because of that action of bacteria. So yes, we can fossilize feces and we can learn a lot from those feces, but I, I like to emphasize the fact that not all coprolites or fossil feces are created equal. And that is because the food that goes into the dinosaur or any other animal that, that uh, produces feces is first subject to digestion. So if food is not completely digested, you do, when it comes out into the feces, you do have dietary residues that you might recognize. But then over time, you have change of that material um, through diagenesis or uh, geochemical and microbial change. And so if, when you eventually get your coprolite, um, you have lost materials um, to both digestion and diagenesis. So some coprolites are very well preserved and can tell you a lot and others don't tell you as much. Now, in terms of studying coprolites, they can be very challenging because sometimes you can't even recognize them. If you look at this specimen at the top of the screen, some that, one, that one definitely looks like a coprolite. So um, people can usually recognize that. But in other cases, like this one down in the lower right, um, that is, uh, all the evidence suggests that's a coprolite too, but it's just not so obvious because in that case, this was from the Jurassic and was those little white, um, I can get my, okay. These white things here are pieces of bone. And this was probably produced by a large carnivore in the Jurassic. And yet, um, that is only a piece of a, a, probably of a much larger specimen. So if you've only got a piece that's broken off, how do you recognize the whole thing? So recognizing whether something is a coprolite or not is the first question that many of us who, who study coprolites have to deal with. Usually I like to look at a number of different criteria. Um, the most obvious one that everybody talks about is the shape, the morphology. And if we're talking about small, or I should say medium-sized animals, say dog-sized animals, the morphology of the feces can be um, very clear. You, if you see small coprolites, they often have a very, very distinctive morphology. Chemistry, I also look at because many carnivorous animals, their diets have phosphate in them. If you see a large percentage of uh, calcium phosphate in, in, in a mass, but not in the surrounding sediment, that is another uh, line of evidence that you're looking at a coprolite. If you see bunches of chopped up organic materials, like chopped up fragments of bone or chopped up fragments of plant tissue, that too can indicate that we are looking at dietary remains. And you have to decide, could these, these, these biotic contents be um, accumulated uh, inorganically, say by fluvial means, by rivers, or is the best explanation that they were accumulated by an animal? And finally, because feces can provide a great source of food for some animals like dung beetles, you often find distinctive burrows in, in coprolites that indicate that this was a valuable commodity when this was soft feces. So when I am studying coprolites, I usually like to have several of these um, criteria before I am willing to say that, yes, this is definitely uh, a coprolite. Okay, if we can identify a coprolite, the next question 
um, that I like to ask is um, who done it? <laughs> Usually it's, it's almost, it's often impossible to say who was responsible for producing a cobra light. So we have to use other means. We look at the contents, we look at the shape, we look at the size. Sometimes we can come up uh, with a, a, a good um, proximity, uh, a good answer as to who we think produced it, especially if we find those um, organisms in the sediments in which we find the coprolite. Um, shape, actually, that even though we, we like to think about shape a lot in, in terms of most fossils, it's really not a very good criterion when it comes to coprolites. The only good criterion is if you see a spiral shape like these shapes, then that indicates that you're looking at a, a coprolite that was produced by a somewhat primitive fish, like a um, shark or a coelacanth or something like that. But more derived fishes um, and all tetrapods, we've lost that spiral intestinal valve. So our feces can be cylindrical, they can be patty-like, they can be irregular masses, they can be pellets. It's not usually diagnostic. Which is why I really like studying dinosaur coprolites, <laughs> because um, if you find a little teeny coprolite, it's conceivable that the animal produced a bunch of pellets, like a pellet group, like a deer. But if you find a giant coprolite that's maybe seven liters in volume, there's no question that that was not produced by a uh, small mammal from the Mesozoic. So you can definitely say that large coprolites were produced by large animals. Okay, how do we study coprolites? Well, we, we look at, we use different techniques. Optimally, we don't like to destroy fossils if we can avoid it. And if that's possible, we do look at the surface. Sometimes we do CT scanning or synchrotron scanning. Um, this is not always easy, especially if you have a, a um, phosphatic coprolite with phosphatic inclusions inside, it's kind of hard to see good density differences. So if you have permission to, uh, just to damage a fossil, and if you have ample specimens that you're not destroying the only one that's surviving or the only example of its kind, then you can photograph something and um, you can do some destructive analysis like chemical analyses and thin sections. And thin sections um, is where you take the specimen like this uh, drawing of a coprolite here and you cut it with a, uh, a diamond embedded saw. Then you make a little thin slice, put it on a glass slide, grind it very thin and examine the inclusions that are inside. But I, I, I made this slide because it demonstrates that you're only doing sampling a very small subset of the whole uh, coprolite and you might find something very interesting in a different find part of the, the specimen that, that you just can't see. You're just serendipitously making a, a slice through this coprolite. So it is what I like to say, um, uh, this is a crapshoot. <laughs> you don't know what you're going to see. But even though you may, may not be able to see it, you can sometimes see a lot. For example, when we looked at these uh, um, crustacean pieces, I didn't make a thin section through this ex exceptional morphology here, but through some other um, pieces of the crustacean, you could see very clear laminations that indicated that these mystery black cuticle here is actually um, 
is actually crustacean. So that's how we knew that the coprolites from the herbivorous dinosaurs that we were studying had been feeding or had ingested crustaceans. On the right here is some of work by Martin Kvarnstrom from um, University of Uppsala. And he has done some spectacular analyses of, very, uh, of, of, of coprolites. Um, he's done a lot of work on Triassic coprolites and they have found some spectacular things like these insect pieces inside. Um, he's found other things um, inside coprolites like this. He's done just the synchrotron analyses is really, really exciting. Sometimes you can see um, exquisite molds and casts of uh, materials um, either on the external surface of a coprolite or else inside. This work on the left was done by uh, Meng and Weiss in 1997. These, this is a Paleocene co coprolite. Um, so in from the from the Cenozoic, and they actually found beautiful impressions of fossil fur. And on the right, Caroline Northwood actually, oops, demonstrated um, insect parts in coprolites. And that's in part because the calcium phosphate of many coprolites can really record very exquisite detail. Plant tissues are, are rare to find in coprolites because even though they were far more herbivores than carnivores, there always have been, or not always have been, but certainly in our modern ecosystems, there are far more herbivores than, than carnivores. Car uh, coprolites with, um, from herbivorous animals that contain lots of plant tissues they're much rarer because they don't have the, they're not full of, uh, the diet is not full of phosphorus. And so it, they require an external source of a mineralizing, um, el ele mineralizing elements to actually preserve them. So plant coprolites or coprolites containing plants are much rarer. I just thought I'd throw this, uh, um, picture in because this shows some of the work we did in uh, 2003 where we looked at this Tyrannosaur coprolite that we estimated geometrically to be a minimum of seven liters, six or seven liters in volume, um, very large, and it had bone in it, so we knew it was a um, from a meat eater. And we also found these very distinctive of impressions. And when uh, I made thin sections of some of these distinctive structure, just structures, we could see clear evidence of, of skeletal muscle that have myofibular striations. On the left, this is, um, this is all the fossil material from that Tyrannosaurid coprolite. This is on the right, this is um, skeletal muscle from um, an extant rat, and this just shows the uh, diagram of how um, muscle fibers are packed together. And we, we found a similar kind of organization within this coprolite. So um, before I answer any questions that any people might have, I would like to say that I appreciated the fact that Steve Brissett actually talked about trace fossils, the, the great tracks he was studying. And um, trace fossils are really important. Bones, of course, they provide so much information if we're, if we're talking specifically about dinosaurs or, or other animals that they're skeletal body fossils, shells, bones, leaves, wood they tell us what ancient organisms look like, how they were constructed. But it's often very difficult to tell too much about how um, organisms behaved. So if we can look at trace fossils like coprolites or, or fossil footprints or burrows, we can learn 
um, about some of the interactions between animals and about their behavior. In particular, coprolites can be very difficult to recognize. We may not know who produced them and they may not be well preserved, but still we're beginning to learn things about ancient life that um, tells us a lot that we can't learn just from skeletal fossils. So with that intro, um, if anybody has any um, questions, I would, I would love to answer them. All right, thank you, Karen. Um, not a question, but we do have a shout out for you. Um, somebody donated and wrote, Hiya, thanks, other, let's see, basically just a shout out to Dr. Chin for sticking around so we could hear about her super cool work. Thank you from a CU Museum alum. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and they that's also- from Jessica mentioned. Holm. Oh, that, that's the name? Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you, thank you. She also wrote, I work with kids and she's one of my all-time favorites to tell them about because nothing hooks a six-year-old like dinosaur poop. That's true, that's true. I'm glad you used that, Jessica. <laughs> There's a, uh, a question from the chat. Have there been papers published on bacteria mineralizing feces? A friend of mine might get a kick out of it. Um, I... Some people have dabbled in trying to do actualistic experiments on documenting the role of bacteria in, in mineralizing feces. Um, I don't know of a, a, a paper that has, a published paper that has documented that, but I have talked about that possibility of somebody doing that research um, with some people. And I know that, um, I believe it was Liz Johnson and Dave Riccio. I believe they did some preliminary work on that. I think that's an excellent idea. You'd have to set up the experiment very carefully, but just like um, people like Derek Briggs have done actualist experiments, experiments in terms of fossilizing bone. And one of my former students, um, Joe Daniel, um, Joe Daniel actually took cubes of bone, cow bone, and some of them were put in sterile sand and some were put in um, sand that had been inoculated or re-inoculated with bacteria. And he found definitely a difference in calcium carbonate growth in the ones that had bacteria versus the ones that, that did not. So there are different experiments that people could do and I'm, I'm anxious for someone to do that. Uh, we got a question from Jack asking, animal droppings are undoubtedly super important parts of the ecology of an area and some of the big sauropod leavings must have been spectacular and supported small communities. Are there any examples of coprolites with other organisms like dung beetles preserved within? Well, actually, I think the best, well, I'm a little partial, maybe. Okay, let's just say I'm more familiar with my work, right? Um, some of the work that we have done on coprolites from the two medicine formation has begun to real to to show communities of organisms we have these large seven liter coprolites that are filled with um rotted wood which is in itself really ex exciting that demonstrates that these particular herbivorous dinosaurs probably myosaura fed on wood that was already rotted. Um, and we could tell that by looking at the microscopic um, structure of the wood, the, the cellular structure. So right then we were linking um, a dinosaur, herbivorous dinosaur with conifers and with white rot fungi. And in those coprolites, we also find burrows that are very distinctive that tell us that dung beetles were were colonizing these these uh, these fecal masses, and 
we found burrows that range from two millimeters in diameter to three centimeters in diameter. So this indicated a whole community of different kinds of dung beetles that were capitalizing on the, the dung from these animals. And in the same coprolites, we found um, snails, uh, both terrestrial and aquatic snails, which you wouldn't expect to see aquatic snails, but I believe these these, these feces were preserved after a flood. So after they were flooded, the, the dung probably attracted the aquatic snails. And, and as I, when we wrote the paper on, on that study, I learned a lot about snail diets and the fact that many snails feed on bacteria and, and other microbes. So dung often offers a perfect environment for them to um, for them to live in, because not only is it moist and sheltered and cool, but it provides all of this uh, bacterial food. Um, and also, if you think about the difference between the dung beetles and the, and the snails, the dung beetles require dung in order for them to lay their eggs and, and grow up. The snails are more opportunistic opportunistic dung feeders. So they could only um, get dung that is easily accessible. And because it takes so much energy for a snail to move, anytime a snail or a slug moves, they have to lay down a, uh, a strip of mucus, which is energetically expensive. So if, if there's dung, oh, 25 feet away, that may not be accessible to that dung. To, to that snail. But if a dinosaur happens to defecate right near a snail, it's just, it's kind of manna from heaven for that snail. So in this case, we were able to put together dinosaurs, conifers, fungi, dung beetles, and snails. So we have a, a food web a clear food web with at least five organisms, and we're working on enlarging that food web at this time. That's really cool. I realize snails also ate dung. Yeah. Some people actually, people who study snails, I, I read about this in some papers, they'll put, they'll take a stocking and put dung in it and they'll submerge it into an aquatic ecosystem and the, the snails come to it. No kidding. Um, let's see. Um, we got a donation from Jasper Barnes with kind of a general, how are you doing question. <laughs> <laughs> um, how am I doing is that um, in terms of the pandemic, um, I don't know. Just... I, I, I think that's that's probably a how are you doing in terms of the pandemic and everybody just being stuck inside, field works canceled mostly and all that. Right. Well, thank you so much. What was his name? Jasper. Jasper? Jasper. I'm sorry, who? Jasper. Jasper. Okay. Thank you, Jasper, for asking. That's very kind of you. Um I think all academics are kind of struggling with, with a new reality to a certain extent. On the other hand, we're very, we also realize we're very fortunate in be a, being able to conduct most much of our work um, from our homes. Um, I'm a little apprehensive about the coming fall and how, um, well, how that will be taught. And we're hoping to have a hybrid um, educate, we have hybrid courses where we're doing some online and some in person, but this is going to be a new world for many of us. So um, we're hanging in there, but thank you. For sure. These are interesting times. Yes, they are. Um, we got someone in the chat who said, I was told if you, you can tell if it's a coprolite if you lick it as the minerals absorb water differently. But I wonder if the guy who said that was messing with me. Well, I think that people often do that in terms of looking for bone because 
uh, bone often is so has such a, a tight surface that it differs in terms of a sedimentary rock. So if you, you stick it on your teeth, it tends to stick, whereas a rock may not. And I have had many people um, point that out when we've been out looking for, for bones. Um, I, I think it would only work with coprolites that are highly diagenetically altered so that you have all the pore spaces in the coprolite actually infilled with um, minerals so that you can create a very um, non-porous surface. So I, 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 I can see why they asked that question. Yeah, yeah, I'd heard about it for bones, but not yeah. for coprolites. Right. I mean, that's, that's a pretty common, you know, newbie fields work trick. It's like, ha ha, <laughs> look what you just did. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's another question um, from chat. Uh, one, one of their people is really interested in science communication, working with students and volunteers. Do you have any graduate program suggestions for someone interested in working in administrative or education side of paleo? Oh gosh, you know, that's a really good question. Um, there's, there's so much is being done these days in terms of, of um, people are learning so much about pedagogy and the best ways to teach people. Um, I think there are two ways that people could go about what your question is. You could either go through a traditional um, paleo educational program um, and learn education on the side, which means you, in other words, you could go through biology, you could go through geology, or you could go through, say, museum education, um, museum, a muse museology uh, program, or you could actually go into education and learn and specialize in learning pedagogy and on the side do um, academics. Um, I think there are some, I know some people who are just exceptional in learning, in, in, in teaching. Um, and I, I'm, I, I have to be honest and say, I don't know what the best route to do that is. Yeah, I imagine it's a little different for everyone. Yeah, I think if somebody wanted to continue to do work in, in um, to continue to do paleontological research, then it, it'd probably be best to go a traditional academic route. But if they really wanted to push the boundaries of learning how to best teach people things about earth science and other sciences, then maybe it would be best to go education. Sure. And, and who knows what that is even going to look like uh, starting next semester. Exactly. <laughs> so Exactly. When, I, when I've been working a little bit on the class I'm going to teach this fall, I realize that there are so many different possibilities of, of different approaches to teaching. And it's pretty overwhelming. I wish I knew a lot more about teaching than I do know. <laughs> uh, what what has the potential to be a, a another self plug for you? Uh, a couple of people are wondering if you have any social media accounts to uh, to follow. Oh, that's so nice that people would want to follow my social media. Um, actually, I I am not on social media, and um, that's because I I am having an, enough trouble just keeping up with all my other responsibilities. And I think if I were on social media, I would, I would spend too much time on it. So I'm, I, I'm, I don't do that. But I do follow some other people's Twitter accounts anonymously. <laughs> scientists, scientists, Twitter accounts. Paleontologists and evolutionary biologists, yes. Um. A, a comment is so sweet. I die. Thank you for answering. <laughs> I 
Any more questions, anyone? Give it another another minute or so on the uh, on the email questions, and donation questions coming in. But if nothing else, I think that uh, I think that'll probably do it for Dr. Karen Chin. Thank you so much for for coming and uh, staying through our our scheduling issues. Oh no problem. Thank you so much for doing this. And again, I'd like to thank everybody who has put this together and all of you who have donated to to help us um, uh, help us acknowledge all underrepresented um, minorities and especially the Black Lives Matter um, uh, organizations and the, the push for better equality these days. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm getting lots of thank yous in the chat as well. Whole lot of thank yous. Hope to see you at SVP one year, assuming SVP starts again. Yes. Uh, yes, I, 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 I hope to see that. Let me also just say, since we, we have a few minutes here, that I have been very happy to see that there are many other, I mean, oftentimes when people think about coprolite research, um, they, some people will immediately say, well, that I, I do that. And yes, I am working on that. But I have been excited to hear about so many other people working on coprolites within the last 10 years. A lot of people are doing great work out of Poland, out of Spain and, and um, South America. And forgive me, there's, there's so many people in South America doing great coprolite work that I I'm not separating the different countries um, and also out of Sweden. So um, I'd like to give a shout out to all of, of not only my co-workers that work on, on coprolites, but also all of the wonderful people who work on, on trace fossils. Awesome. Right. Well, cool. thank thank you again for uh, for joining us, and I hope you have a excellent rest of your day, weekend, and hope you enjoy the stream. If you decide to stick around and watch, I think okay. uh, up next we've got a, a large art chunk. Uh, so excellent. Well, thank you so much, and good luck, and keep donating. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.